this returning safely is going to be a great a, a great subject for us all to, to have a look at, and mainly because of all the problems we've been having as we've gone forward. So in terms of that, this is a, an abs- a presentation that's been put together by the operational team, and I, and I hope that we're going to have a good time just talking about it for the next little while. So there's going to be a lot of guidance here. Let's just see what happens. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the mental health the COVID-19 response, returning safely and, and the saving healthy people and, and about shift work. And, you know, we're going to look at how IOSH and its members and training partners have responded and, and continue to respond with what's been going on during the pandemic, and including sort of this returning to, to, to safety package. And it's, it's how we can look at it and how we can assist in people returning safely, because as we know, the, the safely part is not just about safety as in the health and safety that you would see on a construction site. Uh, it's more about the safety of people that's inside and not what's just going on outside. And over the last few months, you'll have seen a lot of organisations doing similar similar things, but I always felt it prudent to put something down into uh, a nice presentation to share with you all. So for those of you that, that don't know, and indeed some of you might be uh, IOS members, I know one or two of you, I know, I'm sure that Gordon is, um, uh, are IOS members. And what is IOS? Well, for those of you that don't know, um, we are we act as a champion, uh, an advisor, an advocate, a trainer for health and safety. And there's over 48,000 members globally, and I think over 130 countries. So in terms of that, IOSH, as well as being a professional body, a member of this organization, it's also an enabler. And we see ourselves as a thought leader. We see ourselves as partners. And we really like to, we want to work with those leaders, those other thought leaders as well, and, and really try to use all the information that for us is in, in, in underpinned by research, expertise, um, to really push that vision of, of a safer and healthier part of work so mental health and well-being we we can all say that that all of us so far are being heavily involved in different aspects of um, mental health and well-being over the last few months and you know i'm just going to read some stats here that part of this envision includes the mental health and well-being of working people we know that the cost to the, the employers of poor mental health among the workforce is between 33 billion and 42 billion pounds per year in sick pay and lost productivity. Now, like everything else, line managers play, play a key role here. And again, understanding the, the, the risk to their own staff. And, and I know that as a line manager myself, that it's something I'm constantly thinking about. And I'm not just constantly thinking about it because I'm a line manager, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about myself. So if I'm thinking about myself, then I should be really thinking about the other people that that, that are there for me to... To, to manage and, 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 and work with on a daily basis. So basically, IOS conducted a survey of more than 400 employees from a variety of businesses uh, across the UK to get a cleaner picture, a clearer picture of what is being done. And uh, the sample was split into two groups to enable us to evaluate the results from each group appropriately. One group comprised of managers uh, and uh, who have employee support directly to them, and the other comprised of managers without any direct reports. So those, i.e. me, looking after some people, and then those that didn't have anybody reporting to them at all. And and these results were explored in a white paper, uh, Workplace Wellbeing. So the report in itself really explores um, how well-equipped line managers are, the skills needed to safeguard, um, what approach organisations are taking to create a work environment, and and the stigma sounding mental health. Now, among the findings, there was 57% of respondents said their organisation offered no mental health and wellbeing training and or support for managerial staff. Shockingly, 80% said they'd be reluctant to discuss their mental health with their line manager for fear of it being seen as incapable in their role, suggesting that the subject is taboo. So it's quite clear that even though during this time when mental health was impacting us so much, that we still have that taboo where we can't talk to anyone. And, and for those that don't know me, I have made it very clear uh, in my time while I was while I've been part of IOS that I had my own uh, troubles um, uh, a few times in my army career, a couple of times in my army career, which I had no problem speaking to anyone. 
And the armed forces themselves now are leading the way in, in what they do in terms of mental health and mental health training. And I know that my company the, that I work for is, is a massive thing for us. And we have a set manager who looks after all our mental health. We have quarterly meetings, monthly meetings, and, and it's a massive, massive thing for our company. So um, that, that, those, those stats are quite shocking for me anyway. So what was our response then? We have to look back to earlier this year in 2000 when COVID-19 was declared um, a pandemic. And, and as we know, different measures were put in around the world. Um, you know, it depended what country you were in. It depended what was happening in that country at the time. Um, it was depending what everyone else was doing because the, 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 sort of the spread of the, the pandemic was a little bit slow, then it got a little bit faster, then it went slow again, and, and now it's starting to key up again. So what was clear to, to us as IOSH is that we had to make sure that we had clear information, um, we knew the health risks, and we made sure that as a professional body uh, for occupational safety, how we were going to respond. So on the 16th of March, um, IOSH began to communicate that we were supporting our members. Um, and made sure that at this difficult time, we also contacted our training partners to shore support, rapidly working with them to move the courses online. And, and I think any of you that have seen that what the IOSH has done uh, in, in the last part of this year, um, you'll have seen a massive, massive amount of work trying to get this going uh, online as quickly as possible. And then again, in March, IOSH then redirected all its work, all its research, its writing, its designing, communicating, everything that it could do, content, just con concentrating on the content of the COVID-19 material. Um, we created a knowledge hub, um, which I, I can get details to Sarah for you after this. In fact, Sarah will have these, these uh, PowerPoints anyway. Um, and this, I, this, this knowledge hub, which is uh, www.iosh.com forward slash coronavirus continues to grow as the pandemic responses change. So people go in and they look at everything that's going on. And this also helped with trying to provide advice and helping workplaces with workplace hygiene and preventative measures. Uh, and then support managers and staff um, to help with the remote working that was obviously going to come into effect. And looking at the ergonomics of home working um, and working from home mental health. I mean, there's a lot to be said about coming into an office. Um, whether you come into that office one day a week or two days a week, it's important that, that, and these are the sorts of different initiatives that companies are doing. They're, you know, having people working from what, three, four days a week, and then one day a week, either at the start of the week or the end of the week, that they're coming in to, to have part of that team uh, ethos rather than just constantly on your own at home. So IOS reached out to our global partners uh, and national bodies then approached us to use, uh, to use our export content to, to support their own members as well. So, now what's happening? Lots of organisations are now starting to consider how they reopen and get people back in workplaces. Um, and then some of them have started this process months ago. And in fact, my company and myself with, with our team as our director, we didn't stop on the 23rd. We were, all, we were already starting looking on the 24th of March, how we went about in this sort of new world of, of getting people back to work. What did we have to do in order for everyone to work safely? And, and our work started on the 24th of March um, and, and really, really started to take off in the middle of April when we had to relook at everything, risk assessments, people coming to work, people coming on work, people going to changing rooms, people eating, um, people uh, socially distancing, socially distancing while working. All those things were all done from our side. And this is, this is me and talking about my work side, but this was a process that was never going to be able to be done overnight. And, and IOSH has really looked at what it has to do in order to make this returning safely campaign work. Um, and, and another thing as well, on the online hub, uh, we're looking at developing three e-learning modules to help support employees and managers of the safety risks around COVID-19. So, you know, IOSH is there. It's producing a lot of this material. If you go onto the IOSH website, you, you'll see a lot of this material, and, and we're hoping that um, everyone will be able to use it. At the same time, IOSH had to set out their new policy position. And, and, and we say health and safety must come first. 
even when considering restarting work during the COVID-19 outbreak, protecting workforces, communities, enhancing engagement and productivity. You know, for, for organisations, it is quite a systemic, isn't it? It's a, a systematic plan, do, check, act, an approach and forward think, and really look at what you're trying to do. And as we know, those of us that are in construction or, in, or those of us that are in the, in the quarrying part, I mean, I don't think construction stopped because I, I know that you... As, a, as, a, as, a, as an organisation, and your members haven't stopped. So everything has changed. How much change have we seen since the beginning of April to now approaching the beginning of November? It's it's a constantly moving thing. So in terms of that, then, a policy position also states that employers need a planned, risk-controlled approach based on strong leadership, work and involvement, and health and safety advice. Now, for me... I don't think this is much of a change because before COVID, surely it was always the same. I mean, okay, the policy position is that policy position. But in terms of working safely, we also have strong leadership, worker involvement and health and safety advice. But just utilising it in a different way is it's a different it's a different thing that's coming to us at this moment in time. So we're having to think that a little bit differently. Finally, the advice as well from IOS is that it says that organisations need to adhere to applicable national COVID-19 security policy and guidance. And that includes safe travel and conduct inspections and assessments of all relevant areas. We need to work harder while, while we're at work now in terms of making sure that we look, we, we look after the hygiene, look after our own hygiene, look after the hygiene of our work desks, work out how we do the hygiene of our work desk, who does that. We also need to work out what happens if someone has gone ill with a positive COVID who was in the office before. How do we do that? How does that become clean? So returning safely then, safe people, safe workplaces, safe systems and safe equipment. On our hub, it, it, it gives you all that, all the stuff, apologies for the non-technical terms, all that stuff that you can look at that helps you to ensure that your people, your places, your systems and your equipment is being looked after. And it also provides guidance around the risk assessments as well and legal obligations. And there's a lot of information that I'd like to turn to now uh, on the first of those three areas, people. How can organisations ensure that their people are safe and healthy when they return to work? whether they are on site or working remotely. How do we do that? When it comes to safe people, we advise, assess the risk and protect all workers. Ensure only workers who can't work from home and who can return to work safely. Provide adequate training, consultation, communication and awareness and support home workers. Again, for me, no massive change in terms of how we do things and how we assess risk, but we need to make sure that our people are being supported. And there's lots of stuff here that we need to think about. We need to think about the training. We need to think about the ergonomics. We need to think about the well-being for home workers because when staff return, organisations should expect to see a rise in sickness and absence, especially in the immediate term. Should they have key performance indicators for sickness and absence, they should account for such potential rises in sickness and absence. So we need to be aware that perhaps more people that are working from home or are working in the office, as this pandemic goes on and on, there will be a larger rise of, of people that, that can't come to work for whatever reason during the, the, the guidance that we're seeing just now. I mean, at the moment, if someone from your household tests positive and you're okay and you've been to work, then you and you're in the same household then you need to be staying there and making sure that if you if you do get the symptoms, you do get the test, and then we know we know about the self-isolation and the guidelines are quite clear. So communication. The organizational plans are going to change, and then a lot of organizations have probably have changed um, because people will be working from home. How do we keep in touch with remote workers? Um, how do we set the working hours and boundaries, encourage mental health discussions and positive messaging and motivation? How do we do that? So when we are protecting the, the mental health of, of, of people, especially people that are working at home, communication is key. And I know at the start, and a lot of organisations were the same, but when there was a lot of people working from home, um, there was a lot of this new all our, our new Teams or Zoom or whatever the other platforms are. 
And people were doing meetings every day. They were reaching out. Um, there was all sorts of different initiatives going on to pe bring people together. And I think one of the biggest things is that for, for good leadership for me, it's about what the organization's doing and, and how the organization communicates that and how the organization leads and encourages these mental health discussions. And there's lots of different ways that people are doing. They, they ask the question or creating hubs uh, online or creating quizzes and, and making sure that you come in for a coffee break or and reaching out in different ways. And, and that whole part of communication whilst working remotely is absolutely key. And, and as we continue to go down this road, coming into, I don't know, we're going to have another two, is it going to be three, is it going to be another, is it going to be four? We need to we need to be really getting our heads around how we support everyone and how we communicate. And, and I, my communication skills, I believe, have got better, much better over, over these months because they've had to be um, in terms of communicating and reaching out. So what is health promotion? This is another good one. And, and I think it's something, again, I mean, these are things that you're probably already doing. And it's just a lot of this information has come. And I also now created, as I said before, this, this, new, this new presentation. And, and I, would believe, I would like to think that a lot of people are already doing this. You know, well-being information, healthy sleeping, rest breaks, physical activity, nutritious food. So, again, just think about that health promotion. And we have this as well in our areas. We have the healthy food. Are you getting enough sleep? Are you taking enough breaks? Um, how, how is your physical activity? What are you doing at the weekends? What are you doing when you go home? And just to give you a little bit of um, interest from me, I'm on the train. I'm up at five in the morning. I'm on the train at 25 past five. Uh, I get into London at half past seven. I'm on site after a bit of Weetabix for eight o'clock. I'm on site for a few hours come off site, get some work done, back on site for another few hours. I'm back on the train at half past five. I'm home for half past seven. I'm in the swimming pool, swimming a mile at eight o'clock. And that's my week from Monday through to Friday, which is busy. But it's, for me, an absolute routine that I key into. And then in the weekend, it's it's, it's about the family. Um, but that, for me, that Monday to Friday part is, the, is my health promotion. You know, my food is cooked. I take it in. There's no fast food eating clean and doing all that because I need to for my own mental health, health being. And I think there's a lot to be said about getting to your bed and, and having that seven hours sleep. It's been scientifically proved. But to have the, the routine in place as well, to have the regular breaks, to have that kickback, not to do work on the train when you're heading home, to read a book or listen to a book, that for me is health promotion. And, and a lot of what um, Ayosh have asked me to say in terms of, the, the script that I have here with me, it's a lot of that's already in there. And a lot of companies as well now will be doing a lot of things about flexi time, um, coming in, working more, a couple more hours, and then taking that time away to do something else. Um, whether you're taking your children to school, picking them up early, a lot of that for me comes into that health promotion. And and I think one of the biggest things as well that, that, that we've seen a lot more of, because so many more people are stepping up, is this ability to, to, to praise and motivate our workers as well and, and get them to give us the ideas of, of how we move forward. So workloads then. As we know, I, I, I can't be the only one that's saying this, but my workload seemingly got a lot more <laughs> before it got sorted out and on a level playing field because there was just so many things that I was doing via the computer that normally I would have gone and spoke to someone at their desk, but I'm now on the phone instead of popping upstairs and I'm giving them a Teams chat. Seemingly, my work seemed to just really get much, much more before I managed to get on top of it and, and work out my new time management and a lot of this, again, comes through this for us to allow flexibility. And, and again, not having that flexibility causes the problems. It causes anxiety. Um, it causes people to, to misunderstand each other. And you really need to set that routine down, and that's the routine. No plan uh, ever survives, you know, um, first contact, so they say. However, you can put a plan in place. But the biggest part has got to be allowing flexibility. Flexibility has got to be absolutely key. 
And just a quick one here. My boss is actually quite a clever chap. And on top of our work, he's also given us um, reasonable sort of little tasks to do as well to keep us thinking about other things and not just about our work. So even though they are working and we're doing our working day, there's a little task. It's not a, not a difficult task. It maybe take a couple of hours over a month, but he keeps giving us little tasks as well. And for me, you know, you need to make sure those those tasks are there. Now here's a big one, shift work. Now, I imagine from, from yourself and all your members, Sarah, that there's a lot of shift work. Um, sure there's people working through the nights, people working weekends, people you know coming in in the afternoon, working late, maybe not the, the strict nine, Monday to Friday, nine to five. And again, that's a complex, that's a complex situation because every company will be different. And we need to make sure that, that all those people that are on the shift work, we need to make sure that they're getting to work safely, they're also traveling to work safely, getting home safely as well, but also making sure that their, their sleep pattern, their mental health, their health eating, their healthy lifestyle isn't impacted by the fact that they're working different shifts. And that's something I mean, we need to look at, I believe, because my Monday to Friday, okay, it's five till whatever, um, that, that's, that's set. And I can manage that easily. And um, if I was working one shift, three on, two off, and then one on, I, I I would have real problems with that. So I think that's something we really need to look at because it will cause problems. It will cause um, possible injuries and illness at work because people are not sleeping right. Um, and when COVID first hit, I did have some real sleep problems myself. I really found it difficult to put myself in into that routine because I knew I had to. And, and again, we all know the psychological and physical health negatives here and, and about social isolation. You know, people coming in and, and, and working, you know, two or three people on a shift, but not really seeing each other all the time. Um, then going home, coming to work in the dark, going home in the dark possibly, or coming, coming to work early evening and going home in the morning. That has got to play on people's minds. And we know that we've seen that uh, through the years as well. I think the UK's, Royal Nurses, uh, the UK's Royal College of Nursing, I'm going to give you another stat, has raised concerns about increased risk for healthcare workers during uh, working 12-hour shifts in critical care during the COVID-19 pandemic, including the potential for errors or safety lapses caused by fatigue, physical demands of wearing PPE for long periods. I can't walk up four flights of stairs and I've got the mask on. How does that work? Uh, errors when putting on and taking off PPE. Um, some of these are not specific to the healthcare setting, but are relevant across sectors. Again, they may, found, they may sound familiar in your line of work. Yes, they absolutely do. And, you know, the, the fact that we have people doing this amazing work, working on the shifts, we can see the stats coming up now, 20 to, 25 to 30% more at risk, sleep quality, physical health, cognitive function, and mental health, all these risks are all coming into play. When we look at the cognitive function part, and, and, and we've talked about this in the past, in the last couple of months as well, the cognitive function and the mental health, together these may have an impact on safety and health in the workplace, and we know that. And I, I also research looked at three key areas, sleep and fatigue, psychological and mental health, and social isolation. The researchers made a series of recommendations for employees and employers that could offset the worst effects of shift work on health. Individual employees should consider a mixture of common sense lifestyle changes, while employers can make some practical changes to the working environment. And I believe a lot of companies are doing this now, and then certainly without blowing the trumpet too much, um, I know that my company is, is all over this as well. And I believe that every company is probably is looking at this now. So when we look at the sleep and fatigue problems, um, what are those changes? So here's a mixture of what employees can do, um, and we're going to explore three areas. For addressing sleep and fatigue problems among the things employees do are to ensure family and friends know and understand their sleep hours and needs. So again, that, that's quite clear. If you're, working in a, if you're in a house and you're working shift work, then you've got to keep the noise down. Uh, it's easy to get distracted by them, so make sure that we consider um, that they have a comfortable, quiet place to sleep. Establish a sleep schedule to facilitate daytime sleeping. 
Read a book or listen to quiet music if they don't fall asleep after an hour or try again later in the day. So these things I know are all simple things and I'm, I'm reading them for you verbatim uh, from, from, from the IO script that I have. I know I've sort of gone off piece a couple of times, but that, that seems to me to be quite reasonable that someone be able to do that. But again, there may be situations where people don't have that um, exact uh, comfort to be able to do that um, if the children are off or there's people running around or there's visitors coming. And so you need to be able to try and do as best you can to, 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 to lay these sort of ground rules down. Me, I'm quite happy. I live in a cottage in the country and my two sons are, are now living out of the house and, uh, and, and, and there was my wife. So if I was working day shifts or night shifts and I had to sleep during the day, then I, I would be quite, quite comfortable to do that. There are also things to avoid that can prevent you getting the sleep you need in the daytime, such as caffeine, alcohol, and large meals before going to sleep. I mean, for me, as well, I mean, these are normal things. Everybody knows that you don't have a large meal um, and then, and then you know, to try and go to sleep or, or strenuous exercise. Okay, I'm swimming a mile. Uh, but I don't go to bed till, till nine, so I'm nine thirty. So I'm doing my swim, coming back. It's a, it's a mile. It takes me forty minutes. It's nice and relaxing. It's not strenuous. My heart rate's not up. I'm just jumping in the water, clearing my day. So that that for me is a relaxing part for me to get ready for sleep. So again, continue on with sleep and fatigue problems. Um, there are some employer responsibilities on the screen, um, and they're talking about taking adequate breaks. Uh, time between shifts, uh, schedule demanding work, uh, and number of consecutive shifts. What does that mean? Okay, so when we look at the lengths and times of the breaks, make sure that there's adequate time between those shifts. I mean, I don't know what adequate time is, but I would imagine that we need to look at measures including avoiding excessive overtime. Now, we all have different ways of coming to work now in terms of we come through the gate. There's a, there's a, you either sign in and you sign out. You either use a card, you use biometric. So it might be an interesting for some of you to do a bit of work to find out how many hours people are actually working when they come to work and before they go home and see what that hourly part is. And if it's, if it's over whatever your mandated hours are, 48, 50, 60 hours, then that would be something that would be interesting to find out what's happening there and to do something about it. If you're doing a shift change, um, then to look at a bigger break, more than 24 hours, maybe two days rather than the one day. And identifying and treating workers with sleep disorders and assist them and help them. Um, you know, if I couldn't sleep, then I know that I need to change things. And if that means having a nice cup of chamomile tea and switching the television off, I can tell you it certainly works. So if we move on now to the psychological and physical health, um, you know, we'll look at the employees' roles. And for the psychological and physical health, employees need to maintain a healthy lifestyle with exercise, regular meal times, regular meal intake, prioritise tasks, plan your days off. I can tell you what's happening next Saturday. Next Saturday, um, I'm watching the rugby all day. That's the, I, that, and that's happening next Saturday because there's three games on. And then on Sunday, Sunday's Karen's day. So we go for a walk with a dog, go for a nice bit of lunch if we can. If not, uh, we just chill around the garden. And that's quite simple. But that more or less is my, my weekend planned. And I'm lucky I don't have to plan that weekend. My wife plans that weekend because planning the weekends are pretty useless for me. But I'm sort of told what to do. I work well under supervision, in case anybody ever asks. So in terms of your food intake, it's about making sure that you have the right food. And we all know what the right food is. So I'm not going to sit here and, and, and talk about all the dairy, the lean meat and the fruit and all the rest of it. Because I know that when it comes to Saturday and Sunday, um, I'm not eating healthy because I'm doing all that during the week. So it's about having that physical and mental health where you exactly know what you're doing. You're in control. And just to go off piece a minute, just for a second, isn't it very interesting that now that I've been hearing that people who are due to get married once, twice, if not three times in the last year and kept putting it off and now said, no, enough, they're going to go and get married. And they're getting married under their own under their own control. So the, the pandemic is not controlling. So it takes all that mental health. Yes, your family, some of your family's not going to be there, but we have IT. There's different ways of doing it. But it's great to see that people are actually taking control on, on things as big as that, as well as taking control of their lives. And I think that's the big message that IOSH are trying to put through here is to take control and make sure that you can do everything that you can to tackle this pandemic. 
So nearly finishing now. We've got a couple more slides left to go on in. I think I'm maybe just on time. I think it was about 40 minutes. Um, we're looking at them, um, continuing on about the employer responsibilities, meal breaks, cafeteria, time off, exercise facilities, stress management. How do we do that? Well, employers need to be out there and need to make sure that if there is a cafeteria, the cafeteria is being uh, controlled in line with the COVID-19 guidelines. And needs to make sure that the, the same facilities that are there for people during the day, for those people that are working through the night, there needs to be the same sort of facilities. They, can't, they must have access to all the usual attributes that would be there during the day. But when we look at, when we look at um, employers and some of the other things that they can consider, in terms of the, the time off, why not? Why, why not consider that? You know, why not consider a four-day week? Uh, why not consider a four and a half day week? Why not consider, you know, midweek working from home or and, and getting your whole staff on working from home in different one days? How, how much well, how much is that good for your psychological, physical health? I know that when I was on, when I was um, not on furlough, but when I was not able to go to work, I had to work from home for that first month from the end of March to the end of April, the middle of April, that I'd never done so much walking because I had the countryside right outside. And there's something about that working from home where normally if you were in the office, you might go for a walk down the street and, and walk out. But when you can go for an hour walk in the country, if you can, or a walk around a park for an hour work, if you're working from home, then why not? Uh, and again, that's something that I know that my company does a lot of. So just coming towards the end now, here's a big one. Social isolation. You know, what do we do about social isolation? Well, for me, from, from my side of it, everything is planned. So I make sure if I was on my own, I would be speaking to people. Um, I would be joining groups. Um, I'd be making sure that I was coming into my company via whatever platform they're using on a daily basis. Um, I know that when, it's, when the COVID first kicked off, our health and safety team were meeting every day. Then we met every four days. Then it was every three days. And now it's every week uh, and on a Monday. So it was all that. And now people might still be going through that at the moment. So for me, it's about making sure that they, they, they speak to their partner every day. They, they, they play with their children every day. They plan days out if you've got family. Um, if you've got no family around you, then reach out to your family that, that you can remotely. And, and that's the way that we need to keep doing things. And, you know, we, we, we used to have a quiz myself and another four of our friends. We'd meet up every Wednesday and we'd cook a meal and it was a pasta night. And we would do a quiz during eating the pasta or it was, you know, a Chinese night or a steak night and those kind of things. And for people that are on their own, it's that ability to be able to reach out. Okay. Continuing on with social isolation then. Um, and just looking to make sure that companies are looking at sort of 24 hour daycare, um, making sure that we have hobbies and interest groups. And again, a lot of companies are doing that. Okay, seven top tips. Lead by example, communicate constructively, be open and honest, listen, be clear, a risk-based approach to health management. Make sure that we are, in summary, many organizations have had to make some rapid changes in response to the pandemic. These may have been put pressure on our occupational safety and health culture, affecting other working environment systems. Absolutely. I mean, it doesn't take um, the brains of an archbishop to realize that this has had a massive effect on us all. So, and we need to be looking at doing things differently. And one big thing that I would say is we need to maintain open, openness and honesty. We need to make sure that we're looking after everybody. As I mentioned earlier, um, IOSH is a world de leading developer of safety and health and wellbeing uh, courses. Um, have a look at the website. Get onto the website and, and see what you can do in order to, to, to assist going forward and seeing how you can use these courses uh, to develop. And remember, there will be a lot of anxiety with people coming back to work because some people have been back to work for months. Some people just be coming back to work now. Some people have been getting on the train for months. Some people just getting on the train now. And it's about having that chat with them, finding out how they are and making sure that that anxiety dissipates straight away. And there can't be any... Um, there can't be any of that, for me, that office politics scenario. People are coming back. Let's make sure they come back safely. Let's be there for them coming back. And lastly, um, if you'd like to find out any more um, on the, um, the stuff that IOSH does, please uh, jump on 
to the the website. It's all there, and um, there are webinars. Um, even if you're not, even if you're not an IOSH member, you can still attend a lot of these webinars as well. Um, you can get you can get hold of me as well. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, so if you want to link in with me there as well, um, I'm happy days. But I just like to say just before I go, um, thank you so much um, for listening. Um, I don't know what questions I can take. I know I've run over about three or maybe more minutes, but um, thank you so much for listening to that presentation. I did add lib a little bit, but there's a lot of information there that I just want to tell us, but I think we got the crux of it. Thank you so much, Viv. Thank you, Sarah. A couple of things. You spoke a lot about mental health, and I think I think it's probably key that we, we focus on, on that. And working from home, it... Uh, how do you think there's is there one secret that we can give to people one one key bit of advice we can give to people when we're looking at the mental health when they're working in isolation and um, because it's something in this industry we've not been used to uh, probably in the past i think a uh, great question gordon i can only give uh, i don't i don't think i would give the i mean there was a lot of stuff there from my Osh about what you should be doing but i could i could tell you from my own perspective um and I could tell you from my son's perspective, who's, who's working in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia at the moment, and, and, and it's quite clear it's routine. You know, okay, I, I think it's been well documented, and you and I have had long good chats. Coming from an army background, um, it's you know, that routine is sort of inbred in you straight away, and sometimes you forget about how to do routine, how good it is for you. But you remember back to the days where you had to get up and make your bed, um, then you go for your breakfast, and then you'd be going for a run. Then you'd be academically doing stuff. And then, and by the time you went to your bed at night time, uh, after you pressed your kit, you'd be shattered. And for me, that's that's the, the, the thing routine for me. So even in isolation, it's having that ability to get up and when the alarm goes off and make the bed and go for the shower and or go for a run um, and have the breakfast. That for me is all about how I dealt with it. And okay, I had my wife with me, but um, you know that first three months. You know, if I didn't have the routine I had, I, you know, I, I, it would just, I don't, you know, I don't want to think about it. It was just um, absolutely, yeah. Not, I think, not I think you, you're dead right with that routine. One of the things that somebody told me that I hadn't really pictured was um, go for a commute, even though you're only commuting to the front room, walk around the block. So actually go for your commute, have five minutes walk and then walk home. Um, and it splits your day from the house to work and work to the house, um, which... It was massive difference for me for my mindset when I was working from home. And I'm going to share something with you all. There's only 70 members here, I think. So during the first month of, of COVID, I was getting up and I would do all my stuff, but I'd stick a T-shirt on and a pair of um, my soft bum shorts and my flip-flops. And then I started thinking, that's not right, because I wasn't, I was doing exactly like you were, Gordon. I was just, I was in the house and I split it up exactly. And I had my lunch at a set time and I went through into my little uh, sitting room and sat there and watched um, the news of one of my American uh, cop programs, eating my lunch for half an hour. And then I was back out again. And then what I started doing about three weeks into it was I was wearing a pair of trousers. I was wearing my socks. I had my shoes on. I had my shirt on. I was dressing as if I was going to work. And exactly as you just said there, Gordon, it was a trip. I was, to, I was going to the cafeteria to make myself a coffee. I wasn't going to the kitchen. You know, and I even got silly at one point where I was eating my sandwiches and I made some sandwiches after my breakfast. It's, I mean, they're silly things, but that, that's exactly what you're saying there, that having that routine gone 100%, mate. You're looking good, by the way. Looking sharp. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you for your loving, uh, Gordon. Thank you. <laughs> uh, have we got any more questions uh, at all for James? I, I can see Bob Woody waving his hand. Ben Williams as well. Us. Yeah. My question was about uh, managing uh, employees that have tested positive and getting them back into the into the workplace. Uh, how it Im impacts uh, employees that are already there and the individual themselves. Yeah. So, um, in terms of my company, Bob, we've uh, we've got our own sort of track and trace that we, we do. So, for instance, if somebody um, phones us up and says they're not feeling well and they're staying at home, uh, they've got a cough or they, they think they have the symptoms, then they they they, they, isol they isolate, get themselves a test. Uh, and if the test becomes positive, then we then know who they've been around that two or three days before. So, if, for instance... Somebody was feeling poorly in the Wednesday. We know exactly where they're sitting. We know where everyone's sitting. And then they go home. And then we do our own track and trace as well, which we help 
Public Health England with, and that goes out, and we contact everybody that was sitting in that area. They then go home just as a precaution again and do the test, and then we see what happens. And if not, then they still self isolate for that that two weeks. So that that's how we're managing from our business. And touch wood, that all seems to be going well. And like everyone, we, we've had a few people that have um, tested positive as COVID because not so much from the workplace, incidentally, but more from their own families. Uh, and their own friends. And it usually happens on a sort of Monday morning, Tuesday, where people have obviously been socialising as well at the weekend. So, yeah, yeah we, that's how we're managing it, Bob. Is that is that how you're managing it? Yes, pretty much so. Yeah, I'd, I'd, uh, I agree. It's just, uh, you know, there's no government uh, there's no government guidance on that. And I think we've just sort of been left a little bit to ourselves to come up with a way of managing it. Yeah, so we're doing more or less what would happen if the NHS was to, if we were, if we were doing those protocols when you go to the pub. So we're doing yeah. the same thing. And as soon as we find out where everybody's sitting, we just give them a call and let them know. And then and then hope for the best. <laughs> yes. OK, thank you. No, thank you, Bob. And was it was it Ben who, um, Sarah, wanted a question? That's ben, if you ask us a question. Sorry, Viv. Yeah, Ben Williams, same company as Bob, <coughs> Deputy Chair of the IQ. Jim, fantastic presentation. Um, I just wanted to follow up on Bob's question. Was um, I think one of the most difficulties with COVID and the guidance is when you're safe to return to work. Um, having first-hand knowledge of uh, testing positive for COVID which I have done in the last two weeks and oh, still here to one. talk about it. I'm feeling much better, thank you. But um, when the guidance, and I'm and I can uh, happy to share this with everyone, that track and trace, you get moided about 30 times, which whether that's reassuring, it, it does reach a point where it gets frustrating. Um, but uh, the, 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 the track and trace people give you good guidance and it's good to follow it. The 111 is very good. But the question following on from Bob was, so having tested positive, you then get told by track and trace after your 10 days or your 14, depending on which one they've told you to stick to, whether it's the date of the test or, or um, when your symptoms come, is you're then told by track and trace not to go for another test for another six weeks at least because you can still test positive. The question you then have is, so I ask the question, so am I, am I free to now go back to work, be within two meters of people? Yes, you're free to leave your home. Yes, you can go back to work if it's safe to do so. But the mindset is, hang on, I could still test positive. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then it's how does that affect your co-workers um, so you know I've been as a as the kind of person I am I've obviously uh, relayed this back to Bob's my health and safety advisor he's a member of IOSH I'm a member of IOSH do IOSH have any guidance on returning positive people back to work oh well that's a, that's a cracking question and that's something I'll definitely take away from this uh, ben and, I, and I'll ask that question because, as far as I'm, I'm aware, there's no, I haven't seen any CLC guidance. I haven't seen anything in Build UK either about um, you know people returning to work as, as the two weeks. So once you once you've had that two weeks, that's you. You're good enough to go back. I, mm. The first, this is the first time I've sort of actually thought about this the way that you've brought it up. And I didn't even know about the six weeks um, in between tests. That's something that's yeah. very new to me. Yeah, uh, exactly. And the same for me. And, and to be honest, um, in managing our company and managing, obviously, through this time, we've done exactly the same that you suggested. Um, and only now my head of HR and Bob, we had a discussion this morning and we went. So I suppose the benefit for me is I, I've lived through it. So now I'm thinking, OK, so if I was one of my employees and we've had a couple that have tested positive, um, is the guidance that we've been given relevant now that I've been in this situation? I have first hand knowledge you of the information I received. Could, could, could you, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to share with anybody that gets in touch with me about how we are dealing with our sort of track and trace type element and how we are about people coming back. But if you'd like to send me an email, please. Um, yeah, I I've just. I don't care. Um, james.quinn at ios.com um, I will ask those questions for you directly um, straight away today okay I'll have Excellent. an answer for you before the end of your conference no problem in Thank fact you, Bob Bob will send you that email for me because no, uh, no problem <laughs>
<laughs> so he's the, he's the advisor. Yeah. Fantastic. Lovely to speak to you, Thank Ben. You. you too. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks, Ben. That's a great, great question. That and uh, and and it is one of the concerns we've we've all got on and how we we manage people back into the workforce. Um, have we got any more any more questions at all? Oh, James. Yeah. Hi, Viv. Yeah. Hi, Jimmy. Good to, oh, good there to see you. Is. <laughs> how you doing? I'm famous for Thorn. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. One of the one of the things that strikes me um, in terms of the the whole pandemic and talking to people in the especially in the last couple of months when we started talking about the return to work and we got over the initial phase, if you like, is is the long term impact on mental health. Is um, from from Irish's perspective, your own perspective, again, sort of talking about the sort of I don't want to use the phrase again, especially with you, your military background, but, you know, it's being brought up as a sort of PTSD kind of element of for, for a generation, this current generation, this is something we've not experienced before. So is that something you would anticipate or you're seeing at all in IOSH or in, in your own organisation yet? Or is that something you would expect to I think given the scale? I think, I think we're starting to see it, uh, James. Um, and, you know, I speak to a lot of my friends, uh, a lot of LinkedIn, a lot of groups that are starting to see this sort of real anxiety coming through, whether that's coming down from a PTSD part or, or mental health part, however way you want to look at it. But there is the anxiety of, of, of not knowing what happens when it comes, if there's another, another surge, uh, the anxiety of not knowing um, how long they can work from home, uh, how long this is going to last. Is this going to be a short term thing? So. I, I, and then there's the people that 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 haven't got got back to work again. So I'm speaking to a lot of my friends, and a lot of them are um, not just veterans, but lots of friends on some of my LinkedIn groups. And there's a, there's a massive anxiety out there, James. And I don't know how IOSH is looking at that yet. I don't know what read more research they're doing on it. And I'm sure as hard as they work, they'll be looking at this research. Hmm. But yeah, I I I honestly think that there's going to be a lot more um, issues to come. That would be my own personal opinion. Um, that would be IOS opinion, but from from me, definitely, and from and I have experienced some mental health issues in the past. Um, that, that I can see it happening, mate, hundred mm. percent. And yeah. and especially, and, I, and I'm not saying especially in your industry, but in those industries where we are always working, and I think your industry is always working. Construction is always working, and, and in terms of the travel as well, um, the hours. Um, and the way that people haven't to change their work, I think that's caused a lot of problems to people. That trying to change those behaviours, James, in themselves is telling, t informing people that if they're going to work closely together. They've got to do this, and they've got to wear this, and they've got to change that. That's causing a lot of issues for some. You imagine you've been in, you, you've been in the trade thirty years, and you're being told now at fifty five that that that's not the way you're doing it anymore. You need to do it that way. That in itself causes anxiety for people, especially their new ways of working. Mm. Not being ageist there, I'm just saying because I'm 54. But um, <laughs> it's just, you know, we've got people that are really struggling to understand that they need to work in a different way. So yeah. that's causing problems. Yeah. Great to see you. And you. Yes, yeah, we'll definitely catch up at some point. But no, really, really thank, no and, th and thank you so much for the invite, James. And I really do hope that IOSH and the IQ can do a, you know, a, a, lot, a, a lot of work together, especially in my year. I'd really mm. love it. Definitely. Fantastic. Thank you, James. Thank Thanks, you, Jimmy. Just a really quick uh, a, a sum up and a, and a thank you from myself, a, um, uh, Jimmy, that, um, you know, it's very, very challenging times that a, um, I, I must admit when they announced HS2 at the start of the year, I actually very rashly said I wouldn't have to work through another recession having worked through four of them. And, they, uh, and wham, bam, we come into a pandemic. And, uh, and I must admit for my own Personal, this is probably the most challenging management uh, of, of my 43 years in the quarrying industry. Um, but but I think there's some real positives, and and I think some of the things that you 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 you, you stressed in your a uh, um, in your presentation, and I, and I and I think one of the real positives is it does give us the opportunity to take control. You know, I think there's it gives us the fantastic opportunity to take control over over the the absolutely crazy travelling that we used to do as an industry, because geography tended to dictate where we used to have to, and, and geology as well. At a, um, and I, I think there is that fantastic opportunity if if you know if we, if we can take control. Some of it is actually taking control of our own calendar. You know, I, I think that here we are on 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 Zoom here. Um, you know, with 70 odd people all, all sharing the same information or getting more used to how we take this information in as well. 
So I think there's a, a, a take control where we can actually improve our communications. And I agree with what you said is that certainly my business, our communications have improved since the pandemic. Absolutely. I think that, and that is one thing that we really have got a, a fantastic opportunity to get, take control. Uh, absolutely. And, and I'm really, really happy you said that. Uh, but the other thing as well is in that presentation, I mean, there was a lot of information in there from IOS that was quite scripted for me, which which I tend to, if anybody said me speak before, I tend to not utilise as much as possible. So I'll probably reflect on that after the presentation. But I think knowing about what we are doing as individuals and as humans and as teams and sharing that, and like you just said, that amazing word, taking control and communicating are two massive things I've learned from that. So if you're saying the same thing and I'm saying the same thing, I'm guaranteed there's probably some to other people saying the same thing, mate. Good. Thank you. And uh, as my cuckoo clock has just told me that it's one o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> We will we will look to wrap up, and I just like to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, thank you, thanks again, J Jimmy. Yeah.